Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Encounter with God Together, our weekly audio and video podcast, where we go over the readings in our daily Bible reading guide by the same name, Encounter with God. Each week, I welcome a guest who kind of gives their own perspective on the readings to come uh, to set us up for the week. And today, I'm happy to have uh, with me Skylar Brown. And Skylar is our digital um, media assistant at Scripture Union, and he's involved in a number of ministries. You're also doing a doctorate right now uh, yes. at Liberty University in strategic leadership. So, uh, Skylar, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Gail. And hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all. And we have some exciting passages today. Um, we're going to be talking about money, which is why I have the mina behind <laughs> me. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so lots of exciting stuff. Um, I'd like what? to, yeah. Do you want me to pray for you first? Oh, I absolutely. I didn't do that. Let me do that. Sure. Thank um, you so much. <clears throat> Father, I do pray for Skylar. I thank you for his preparation for today for his um, uh, love of your word and his ability to communicate. And I pray that you um, use him today to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gail. Huh? So I'd like to start with Psalm 78, 1 through 39, which if you're watching this on Monday, um, then this would be the reading from the day before. This is Sunday's reading. Um, so Psalm 78, uh, 1 through 39 uh, talks about God's faithfulness. So this is a uh, teaching that's passed uh, down through generations. Uh, this is written for public performance, um, but it is neither prayer nor praise, as the encounter with God says. So it's really a psalm that talks about how we will share everything that the Lord has done with uh, our descendants, and we'll tell the next generation uh, the praiseworthy deeds of God. Mm. So God has been faithful in the past. He is faithful now, and he will be faithful. And Gail, I wonder um, what this looks like for the next generation, because Scripture Union USA, we talk a lot about the future generation, about Gen Z and some of the fads and trends going on with the new uh, generation. And it's just, uh, there's a lot of social media. Um, there's a lot of uh, familial past. And um, there is a book called Soul Care uh, by Rob Bremer. And it's uh, very, very important to figure out uh, sort of what has been going on in uh, family line through generations and um, really what faithfulness looks like, what a family's uh, upbringing looks like, and what the next generation uh, will look like. So, yeah, it's something we think about a lot how to continue. Uh, with the, the praise and worship of a new generation and, and the faithful help them to see the faithfulness of God. And yeah. even in places where, where they didn't receive that in their own line, you know, how can we absolutely uh, generate new hope for them? Yeah. Um, so will the next generation be faithful uh, like God has been faithful to us? Or will they be unfaithful like their ancestors? This psalm is essentially saying in mm. Psalm 78, uh, verse 4, it says, We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. But then in verse 8, it says, um, you know, so that the next generation, they would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God whose mm. spirits were not faithful to him. And uh, I really love this song, psalm because in verses 12 through 16, and just throughout the whole psalm, it talks about what God has done. He did miracles in the sight of their ancestors in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and led them through. Uh, in verse 14, he guided them with the cloud by day and with the light from the fire all night. Uh, verse 15, he split the rocks in the wilderness. And in verse 16, he brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. Uh, so he really provides a way in the impossible. And we're going to see that throughout this week's encounter with God. Mm, there we go. And in Luke, uh, we have our first money example. All right. So we have the rich and the kingdom of God. And, uh, a ruler is asking Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. And uh, 
Jesus is saying, sell everything you have and give to the poor. And so this man is not happy about that. And I have uh, several uh, reasons why I believe he's not happy. So when you're looking at uh, finances, and I'm starting a course on uh, Financial Peace uh, University, uh, it's a course that Liberty students go through. And so in my doctorate of strategic leadership, part of the doctorate is to also look at um, how to handle a business or an organization financially. So uh, this man has some incredible wealth. Um, he probably has a lot of sheep. Uh, animals would be considered wealth back then. And some assets decrease in value over time, meaning it makes more sense to hold on to them uh, rather than to sell them now. Mm. Because if you sold them now, uh, the value would decrease and you wouldn't get as much as you paid for it. And it's probably worth more to you than it would be um, to sell and get the money for. But then other assets increase in value over time. Uh, so uh, like cryptocurrencies or stocks, uh, there are some assets that uh, skyrocket all of a sudden and you want to hold on to them in the hope that they skyrocket. So it makes more sense to hold on to those as well. Uh, rather than to sell them now because they could be worth a fortune later. Um, and it could go down, but in the hope that it goes up, people hold on to those assets. So investments, uh, good investments, hopefully increase in value. But Jesus is telling this ruler to sell everything he has. And not just that, not just sell everything that he has and give it to the poor, but if he sells everything that he has now, um, he is getting rid of any hope to increase the value of those investments in the future, um, maybe to rent off the animals um, so that other people can use the animals uh, because animals were useful not just for their value um, in holding, but also their value in work. Uh, so the animals could uh, produce work, maybe produce milk um, and all of this stuff. So. Um, the animals he's probably renting out to make passive income as well. I'm just guessing, uh, similar to how if we buy real estate in this day and age, we'd rent out the rooms so that people have rooms uh, to sleep in and that makes you money as well. Um, but this passage really shows me that the more you have, uh, the more you spend on maintaining what you have, the more you're focused on what you have, and the less likely you are to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I love this verse 25. It says it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle uh, than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of heaven. So, uh, Gail, one of the questions I want to ask about this passage is uh, for our listeners is, well, are there any things that um, we are holding on to in life? And so to write down those things, so if you're listening to this podcast, you could even pause it at this point and write down those things. And if you're watching, um, you can maybe type on your computer some of these things. Uh, what things are we holding on to in life? Mm. And for me, I feel that um, my studies are very important. My schooling is very important. And they're just can be such a busy schedule in life that I hold on to a lot of these things um, where I forget uh, at times that the heavenly value um, is great where the earthly value decreases. So um, if we think about something that's very valuable in this day and age, it might be you know, work or school or material possessions. Uh, those things are really valuable on earth and quite the opposite in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven um, where there's value in the kingdom of heaven as on earth is when we give to those in need, um, when we seek Jesus's will for our life. And it might be uh, an impossible situation where Jesus asks us to uh, give up everything and move and maybe go on a mission somewhere uh, or just uh, pursue a completely different path than we were pursuing. And so it can really take us out of our comfort zone, right? So, mm. um where there is great heavenly value, earthly value decreases. And so later on in the same passage, Luke 18, uh, we get to Jesus predicting his death a third time. And so um, he's telling his disciples what's going to happen to him. They don't understand, but 
I find it very interesting that the next passage, uh, right after this one of Jesus predicting his death, is the blind beggar receiving his sight. And so um, the disciples in the first passage, they don't understand what Jesus is talking about when he says the Son of Man will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him. Um, the disciples don't understand, but there's no indication that they wanted to know either. Um, you would think they would question him, right? I mean, I'm wondering why the disciples didn't say, like, I want to know more about what you were talking about. Like, what's this son of man? Like, um, they will mock him, the Gentiles. Um, what is this? <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm just like, I'm yeah. wondering why they didn't ask. So. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But very interestingly, the blind beggar in the next passage, uh, he uh, calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And uh, when Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? He says, Lord, I want to see in verse 41. Uh, so Jesus revealed to me in this passage that, um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that these are placed right next to each other because uh, the blind beggar wants to see and Jesus gives him sight. He says, receive your sight. Uh, so in the same way, um, my prayer is that, Lord, may we want to see, uh, mm -hmm. even when we don't understand, may mm -hmm. we want to see. Um, even when the disciples, yeah, even when we're like the disciples and we're not understanding, you know, the plans Jesus has for us in the future or some things he's revealing to us that the puzzle pieces are just not fitting exactly right now. Um, May we seek to understand him. Good. That's good, Skylar. Thank you. Praise God. And it's just like there's so many things Jesus reveals to us when we take the time uh, to read his word. And uh, it's just so amazing how in these encounter with gods, uh, there's so many connecting points. And uh, we're getting to the end of the uh, financial part. I'll just finish up the financial part. We're going to talk about Zacchaeus and then what's behind me over here, the mina, the currency there. Um, but then at the very end, I'm going to take a look at Leviticus, um, and I'm going to be focusing specifically on one and two. And even uh, those passages, which are not really financial um, related, still have to do, though, with um, this whole theme, which is amazing. And really, all of these uh, New Testament passages point to Psalm that we read at the beginning. God has been faithful in the past. He is faithful, and he will be faithful um, and are we faithful with what we have, our finances, our life, our time? So mm. let's take a look at Zacchaeus, the tax collector. In Luke 19, we see that Zacchaeus was a chief <clears throat> tax collector and he was very wealthy. So he overcharged everyone and everyone knew it as well. And that's a very important detail I saw in the encounter with God um, that I didn't realize before. Uh, you know, I thought that Zacchaeus uh, at first was just this man who uh, cheated everybody on their taxes. And back then it was very uh, typical to overcharge people for their taxes and gain a little profit. So nobody liked you. Um, everybody knew <laughs> what you were doing and you're kind of doing this in the open, but it was, uh, you know, looked down upon. Like you wouldn't be invited to, uh, you know, uh, a gathering where everybody's friendly towards you. It wouldn't be like that at all. But this important detail from Encounter with God uh, is very relevant and amazing is that um, he uh, came to this uh, place and everybody knew um, that he was there. Uh, so they were, everybody knew that he was overcharging them, but everybody knew that he was there as well. Uh, so when Jesus pointed him out uh, saying, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, it's very probable that everybody there, all the audience there, um, who were listening to see Jesus were muttering to themselves already about Zacchaeus. So um, yeah. when Jesus pointed him out, everybody <laughs> was muttering and, you know, he was all the talk and like, uh, wow, Jesus is going to be the guest of this sinner. Um, look how the tables turn though, Gail. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone watching, those who wanted to see Jesus at first, um, wanted to see Zacchaeus humiliated. Um, really, they were looking at him probably pointing at him, uh, you know, mocking him, seeing, oh, yeah, that, that person stole from me. Look, he's climbing a tree now trying to see Jesus. I bet he wished he could be up front. And really, 
If he were not a tax collector, he would probably be welcomed to the front immediately. He was short. Uh, it would probably be custom for the people to uh, say, oh, yeah, let the short people come see Jesus, you know, not be in the back where they can't see. But no, he wasn't welcome. So everybody knew that. So Zacchaeus, who couldn't see Jesus, wanted to see Jesus. And he saw Jesus on the tree, in person, and in his heart. So I just find this incredible how the blind man wanted to see, Zacchaeus wanted to see, and it's quite the opposite. We think that the people who are close to Jesus, who are in the front row, that they're going to see him the most, but it's really uh, the people who have a heart for Jesus, even if they uh, you know, have lived a life of sin, they've turned from that life. And they want to bless people four times over. Uh, and the end of this passage, it says, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So today, salvation has come to this house. Um, Amazing. I find yeah, that that's incredible. good. And Jesus sees him. You know, that's the, the flip side of that coin that he saw yeah. Jesus and Jesus saw him. And Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jesus sees us uh, in our brokenness. Uh, he sees us when we call out to him, um, even if others seem like they might have more of a spotlight in life. The kingdom of heaven is the opposite of the kingdom on earth. Uh, so, you know, the kingdom of this world uh, is really nothing in comparison to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, tables can be turned, lives can be changed. And really, um, those who have a heart for Jesus, uh, it's worth m much more in terms of wealth, in terms of, uh, you know, treasures in heaven worth much more than treasures on earth so mm -hmm. uh, this is really incredible the tables can turn are we ready for that mm -hmm. and may we be ready for that um behind me is a mina uh, actually it's a lot of minas but uh, we're going to look at the parable of the ten minas and uh just for context a mina was a currency in biblical times that was about three months worth of wages so um, I looked up what this would mean because $64 in today's currency or $101 uh, doesn't really equate because we're comparing different economies. So to put it into best comparison, we're looking at about 100 sheep. And so 100 sheep would be three months worth of wages. And so um, if you received 10 minas, uh, you could probably buy 10 times 100 sheep. Uh, which is a lot. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, so many sheep. So um, in this passage, Luke 19, verse 14, um, really shows why um, the unfaithful servant did what he did. Um, because we kind of remember the story sometimes as, okay, well, all of these um, servants, they were investing the money. And uh, except for the last servant who just... Uh, kept the money the same amount that it is and buried it. But really, the king's subjects knew what kind of king they followed. Uh, they followed a king who uh, they didn't want anything to do with. Uh, in verse 14, it says, But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. So uh, as we know from verse 20 and 21, uh, the king is a hard man taking out what he did not put in and reaping what he did not sow. And uh, I wouldn't want to be known as a person who does that. I don't think anybody would want to be known as somebody who's just reaping off of the riches of uh, that they've made from other people. But what's really interesting is this parable is a parable about faithfulness to do above and beyond, uh, mm. not just what we're asked to do. And, uh, it's just such a very prevalent message in a day and age where uh, society teaches us that uh, there's certain rules that we should follow and we should just um, obey those rules. And uh, pretty much if we follow a certain set of guidelines that everybody else is following, that everything will be OK. Um, but that's not what the kingdom of heaven is like. Um, the kingdom of heaven is all about faithfulness despite challenging or unwanted situations. So these servants didn't want the situation. Um, they said that they didn't want to uh, work for this king, and uh, he was made their king anyway. So uh, they decided to do the first two, 
what was faithful, which was uh, invest and earn 10 more and five more mina uh, than what was originally given to them. Uh, the third servant uh, only kept the mina because he was scared uh, of the king uh, for the king's qualities, um, just uh, reaping what he did not sow. And so um, this really teaches us that despite challenging situations, unwanted situations, even unwanted leaders, mm. uh, that we can have what it takes to uh, do above and beyond for God, uh, because God has placed authority here on earth, so we submit to God. Yeah, so, I like that. Yeah, so Lord, help us to do not just what we're told to do, but more. Right, And finally, the three chapters in Leviticus, Leviticus 1 through 3. Uh, so these are three different types of offerings. These are burnt offerings, grain offerings, and peace offerings. Uh, and I'm going to focus specifically on grain offering and peace offering. Uh, the first one, burnt offering, um, is about presenting a burnt offering uh, before the Lord. And um, we uh, know uh, you can read this passage. It talks about uh, Aaron's sons and the priests arranging the pieces, uh, the head and the fat. Um, and all of those things. Um, but the second one is a grain offering. Um, and in this passage, in Leviticus 2, we see that the responsibility for sin was placed on the sacrificial animals. So uh, even though this is separate from the money passages that we were reading earlier, I can't help but see it as a money passage because a price had to be paid. Um, and we know that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Mm. And yes. so, yeah. Yeah. The second type of offering in the Old Testament, um, the grain offering, the purpose of it was a voluntary expression of devotion to God, recognizing his goodness and providence. And uh, really, God has been so good to us uh, these past few years, uh, these recent years. Um, he has carried us through so many challenges and so many hurdles. Um, and so, May we live our lives uh, giving uh, this grain offering to God. Mm, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, our salvation is not free. Um, that's the other thing that I realized from this passage is that we were bought with a price. So mm. um, to think that our salvation is free um, is not the right way to think about it, even though like we're not paying money uh, for salvation. Um, or Actually, our sins uh, are already paid for. We've, um, you know, we've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And uh, Jesus paid the price for our sins that we, we might have life uh, in him. So when we see uh, the weight of our sin and uh, what Jesus has done for us and who he is, um, we can experience this freedom and really true gratitude for what he's done for us. Mm, that's right. Yeah, free gift of grace, free gift of salvation is how you a lot of times hear it. And it is true that we don't pay, but uh, it is also true, as you pointed out, that that someone paid. It was bought uh, yeah. with a very um, expensive price. Yeah, exactly. It mm -hmm. was not free. So the very last offering in these Leviticus passages is the peace offering. Uh, so this is the third offering. Uh, of this and the last of this encounter with God for this week. Um, but peace is needed in fellowship. Uh, we can't have fellowship uh, without peace. And so uh, I find this to be really interesting. Um, the purpose of it is to consecrate a meal between two or more parties before God and then share that meal together in fellowship of peace and a commitment to each other's future prosperity. Uh, mm. So not just peace for now, but also peace for the future. Um, and so really, this reminds me of Proverbs 17, 1, uh, which says, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. And I feel like these days there's a lot of houses full of feasting with strife. Um, you know, we might be uh, prosperous uh, going back to uh, the concept of money. We might be prosperous and wealthy, but are we prosperous and wealthy in our hearts? And does mm -hmm. that mean we need to set aside the material things for a little bit more uh, time than we're doing and 
spend more time focusing on what truly matters. Uh, God created us to have peace with each other. And so maybe it means uh, doing things a little bit differently uh, than we've been doing. Um, mm. So we're thankful that he's been faithful in the past. Going back to the first Psalm we read, he's faithful and he will be faithful. And so um, may we uh, honor Jesus in all of our lives and be faithful to him. Thank you so much. Some great thoughts there. Great, um, great points that you highlighted. Would you pray to close out our time today? Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this Monday, this new week. We thank you for uh, this opportunity uh, to worship you, to worship you with our whole hearts, with our lives, with all our being. God, you've placed us on this earth with many gifts and talents and skills and wealth. Um, and in all these things, we dedicate all these things to you. We ask that you would please work in our lives. Please show us the areas in our lives that we need to um, focus more on you instead of material things. And also please show us uh, what your will is for us. And it may not be easy, uh, some of the things you call us to do, but uh, we know that there is great reward uh, when we're working for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so please meet our needs and please show us what you have in store for us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry for that little cough there. Um, thank you, Skylar. It was great to have you again. Um, and I always enjoy when uh, one of your family comes on to share. You all do such a great job. I know uh, some of you may remember his brother uh, was on a few weeks ago, Adrian, and, and they are twins. So you're not mm -hmm. seeing double. Uh, so it's uh, it's good to have your unique perspective as well, Skylar. And, Absolutely. And thank you. It's such a blessing. Thank you for having me on here today. Yeah. And have a great week, everyone. And we'll see you next week. All right. Bye for now.